All right, guys, this is slide nine in our uh, 70s unit as we near the end here, talking about society uh, in the decade. And we will start with a movement that becomes very popular in the 70s, the self-help movement. Uh, people looked for ways to make their own lives better, um, such as yoga and meditation, things like that. Now, one guy kind of comes to the forefront here, L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, writes lots of books about how to take charge of your life, uh, make your life better, self-help, things like that. One way in particular that he does that is through the formation of something called Scientology. Scientology. Now, the basic message of Scientology is that um, through coming to know your own weaknesses you can learn to overcome them. So if you know what makes you weak, you can learn to overcome that and be a better person, be stronger. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's a great thing, a great message. It's when he works to get Scientology declared a religion and therefore tax-exempt. He doesn't have to pay any taxes on any of his money for Scientology. Um, the religious side of Scientology is where it gets a little weird. Again, nothing wrong with coming to know yourself and working to be better. Great thing. But uh, the religious side of Scientology says that we are all reincarnated from another being somewhere on another planet in another solar system from another time. So you're not the original you. You were reincarnated from something, somebody else on another planet, another solar system, and another time. And if we want to get to heaven when we die, rather than just being reincarnated somewhere else, if we want to get to heaven, we have to work our way there. You have to study Scientology. And where do you study Scientology and how do you learn all this? You pay to take the courses. Yes, you pay to take a course, and when you've passed that course, you pay to take another one, and you pay to take another one. And the only way to learn this is by buying the courses that L. Ron Hubbard and his Scientology Church sells you. Uh, some of the most famous, uh, Tom Cruise, one of the most well-known Scientologists out there. Um, this this gets is about as crazy as it gets. Uh, it started as a self self help movement good things. But then in order to make more money on it and not have to pay any taxes on it, he gets it declared a religion and it gets a bit kooky. Now, speaking of kooky things, let's talk here for a moment about cults. Um, cults are simply groups of people that prey upon young people. Um, people that... Um, are looking for something. They're looking for acceptance. They're looking to be part of something bigger than themselves. And in the 1970s, that was a huge movement. Okay? Remember, we've got the drug culture of the 60s spreading into the 70s. Um, young people would leave home to go do their own thing, find their own way. Um, and Grown adults would prey upon these young people. And there is no better example of that than a man named Jim Jones. Jim Jones. He founded what he called the People's Temple. The People's Temple in California. Young people would go to California looking to find their way, and they would gravitate to the People's Temple because Jones offered them the chance to, to be part of something else, to be part of his, his family and his group, and they would take them in, and they would love you and take care of you. Uh, they wanted you. Um, when in reality, what he was doing was brainwashing these people, uh, taking them for all they're worth, any money they had. Um, and essentially, you became captive. Once you joined the People's Temple, you weren't really free to live, uh, to leave, sorry. So some parents began to complain to the American government. Look, this man is holding our, our children uh, against their will. They're not free to leave. 
So the government starts to put a little pressure on Jim Jones and his followers. So he packs up and heads off to Guyana, which is on the north coast of South America. And he buys up some jungle land in Guyana. Now here you see a picture of Jim Jones up here in the, uh, the corner. Okay? Now Jones will move to Guyana and take almost a thousand followers with him. And he will found what's called Jonestown. They will build this compound, big buildings, lodges, um, huts, things like that. They will build Jonestown uh, to live there peacefully. Jo uh, Jim Jones had convinced these people that God spoke through him, that the only way to, to get to heaven was through him. Okay? Um, he, he can feel God's presence in him and God's words and that if you did what he said, you would get to heaven. If not, you'd never make it there. He was God's prophet, God, the, the second coming here. Okay? Now, the U.S. government follows these people to Guyana, uh, and they get the Guyanese government to work with them, um, and they're going to raid the compound. Uh, to, to free some people that they believe want to leave but aren't being allowed to. Okay. Well, word comes that uh, the, the compound is going to be raided. And Jim Jones, in perhaps the greatest PR move in history, convinces 900 followers 900 members of the People's Temple religious cult commit mass suicide by drinking poisoned Kool-Aid. Here's the picture. These are all dead bodies at the People's Temple. And they remember Jonestown thing, the Kool-Aid man there? Uh, the expression for, you know, buying into something, believing something that's crazy, you know, you drink the Kool-Aid, right? This is where that expression comes from. They had poisoned Kool-Aid in big, huge vats, vat after vat of them. And people would come through with their cup in this line, and they would dip their cup in the, the vat of Kool-Aid, and they would drink it, and they would wander off and lie down and die just very peacefully drift off into a sleep and never wake up. Parents would come through, dip a cup full, give it to their children to drink, and then they would dip it and drink it themselves. Jones was the last one to die. 900 people commit mass suicide believing this man is the second coming of Christ and that he is the way to salvation uh, in heaven. Um, crazy man, crazy man. I'll uh, show you a video in class. Okay. Now, there's no good segue here to you know, the next topic, so let's just move on. On a much brighter note, <laughs> again, there's no segue here. It's just you go from that to fitness. Uh, we see a new fitness craze in the decade. We're talking about society in the 70s here. So the new fitness craze is jogging. Yes. There's Forrest, Forrest Gump, running. Um, jogging becomes the new fitness craze, mainly because Americans had become fat, very fat. The predominance of fast food was insane. Um, McDonald's, during the decade, McDonald's passed the United States Army to become the largest provider of meals in the United States. McDonald's is making more meals than the United States Army. Um, Americans are getting fat and out of shape. And one easy way to do this, to get back into shape, is to start running. Because you don't need equipment. All you need is a pair of shoes. Uh, you don't have to join a team. You don't have to do anything else. Jogging became very popular uh, as Americans became determined to get uh, into shape again. Uh, let's finish here. We always spend some time during a, a, a unit here talking about music. Um, 
We've gone from, from jazz to patriotic music of World War II to rock and roll to British invasion to, to Motown to protest music to disco. We reach the disco age. Okay? Now, disco forms when it does because of the Vietnam War. Uh, protest music and music surrounding the war was all about the lyrics. It was about the message uh, of how bad the war is and how, how wrong uh, or supportive it is and people dying and all this and that, civil rights abuses. All that. Disco is a direct reaction to protest music because the country got tired of music that was heavy and depressing and all about the message. Disco has absolutely nothing to do with the message. Disco is all about the music, the beat, the rhythm. Can you dance to it? Okay. And disco is written for and originally popular in the gay community. Uh, homosexuals are the first audience that disco is targeted at. And there's no better example of that than the village people. Uh, yes, the YMCA. Yes, everybody's done that at uh, a dance, a wedding, something, uh, the YMCA. The village people are the, the prime example of the homosexual disco band. Right? Uh, men who dressed up in costume here, uh, you know, you've got your biker and your, you know, your cop and your cowboy and construction guy and Indian and army guy. I, they dress in costume, right? Uh, the village people is the poster boy here, poster child, for disco music. Um, if you've, the, the YMCA, everybody likes the YMCA, right? You do the hand motions, uh, it's a great song. If you've not, if you've never read the lyrics to YMCA, I, I, after this slide is over, I want you to go to Google and look up YMCA lyrics and read the lyrics. Knowing now what you know about the whole purpose of disco music, that it's written for the gay community, and the village people are the preeminent homosexual disco band. Read the lyrics to YMCA. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Okay? Now, disco gets played in what are called discotheques. These are nightclubs. Okay? Um, where, um, you know, they open all night long, disco music is played, dancing is had, and basically, any sort of drugs or sex that you want and you can afford can be had. Okay? The most famous of these was uh, a discotheque in New York City called Studio 54. It was the preeminent nightclub in the country, discotheque um, in the country. The, um, they, they become popular by limiting access. It seems backwards, but if you think about it, it makes sense. If anybody can get into somewhere or if anybody can buy something, there's nothing special about it. Studio 54 becomes popular because it limits access. Not just anybody can get in. You had to look the part. You had to have the clothes. You had to have the look to get in. You had to be able to contribute something to the party. If you could not bring something to the party... They didn't want you, and they didn't want you in there. So they would use bouncers to keep people out. Uh, so by limiting access, you make something very popular. Uh, and Studio 54 was the, the masters at doing this. So I'll play some disco music for you in class. You're welcome, or I apologize, whichever. <laughs> 